<laughs> there we go. All right. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people just like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today, as often happens with many of the guests, my guest today was highly recommended by a previous guest who you all know, Dr. T. Colin Campbell. His name is James Hicks. He has a newer book that he's going to talk about called Outcry, and he's also written many other books, including The Four Leaf Guide to Vibrant Health, along with Dr. Kerry Graff, and Healthy Eating, Healthy World. And a fun fact about Jim is that he was the only non-family board member for six years for the T. Colin Campbell Foundation. Please welcome Jim. Thanks so much for being here. I love the sound of your voice, so I can't wait to hear your presentation. Oh, thank you, AJ. Uh, by the way, I was I was the first uh, non-family member, but there were several others that served with me as well. So just wanted to clarify that in case any of them are watching. <laughs> well, thank you. I, okay, I didn't, mean, I didn't mean to misspeak, but that's still, he must have think, thinks very highly of you too, because now you mentioned that there's only family members that are board members now. So to have a non-family member for six years, he must think very highly of you. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I think, think very highly of him and his family. Yep, I think everybody does. He's sort of like the father of modern nutrition in a way. He is. And he's the reason you're here because when I, when every time I have a guest on the show, I thank them by sending them a couple of bottles of California balsamic vinegar and, and an email saying, is there anybody you'd like to recommend? And you are who he recommended. So maybe tell us a little bit about your story. I've heard you, I've heard some of your wonderful presentations on YouTube, but what got you interested in this? Well, I, uh, I got, I got curious about the optimal diet for humans back in you mean share my screen or anything? Or? Well, only when you're ready to do the slides. If you want, you can talk just for a few minutes so that we can know who you are. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, back in 2002, I got curious about the optimal diet for humans. And I just started looking on the internet and finding books to read. And within a couple of months, I'd found T. Colin Campbell and Esselstyn and Furman and, and Ornish and McDougall and, you know, all, all of the primary ones. And Within a couple of three months, I had concluded that the optimal diet for humans was whole plant-based foods. And then in May, Memorial Day weekend of 2003, I read two more books. And one was uh, Diet for a New America by John Robbins. And the other one was Mad Cowboy by Howard Lyman. And that's when I had what I call my blinding flash of the obvious when I said, oh my God, we're, we're eating the wrong food for all kinds of reasons, not just health. And so at the time I thought that I would get into business help. I, I've been an executive rec recruiter and I've been a management consultant and a senior executive with various companies such as Ralph Lauren. And so I'm comfortable in the business world. And I thought I would go and help clients, big businesses uh, save money on healthcare. And that just did not, did not ever pay out, uh, work out. So I never got any clients that wanted to do that. They were too nervous about trying to suggest what their employees ate. So I began a blog and, and began to try to meet all of the people that I had been learning from. And uh, after about four or five years, I decided that I would write a book because I found that there's a lot of great books out there about the diet, but there aren't too many that cover the diet and all of the environmental reasons or eating, eating a whole food plant-based diet. So I published the first book in, in 2005, Healthy Eating, Healthy World. Actually put my son's name on the cover with me, Jay Stanfield Hicks. And uh, a few years later in 2015, I published The Four Leaf Guide to Vibrant Health. And I wasn't even planning to do a, a different book. And people would ask me, when are you gonna write another book? And I would say, when I have something else to say, and so I met Carrie Graff. She had emailed me to ask if she had permission to use my four leaf survey in her practice in, uh, in New York state. And so I gladly gave her permission to use it. And then she invited me to speak in her town and we got to know one another. And then I kind of floated the idea of maybe, maybe we should write a book together and and you write chapters about health and your patients, and I'll write chapters about environment, and and we'll call it the Four Leaf Guide to Vibrant Health for Humans and for the Planet. So we did that, and that was in 2015. And since 
actually it started in 2013 when I really started getting more serious about the environment than I was about uh, human health. Because if we, if we, if we don't survive as, as a species on this planet, it doesn't really matter how healthy we are. So that's been my primary focus in recent years. But in everything that I do, food remains a very, very large part of the foundation and the theme of everything I do. Because no matter what we do in, in terms of changing our lifestyle habits, if we don't change the food, we will never learn to live in sustainable, in, uh, sustainable lives on planet Earth. I love how you call this a blinding flash of the obvious. I've never heard that. That's great. That's a great term. And you w wish other people would have that, don't you? Yeah, that's right. That's what is your four leaf survey? And can we still access it? Because that sounds like a lot of fun. I'm gonna, uh, I've got a slide in the presentation that has it on there, but uh, it, you can go to fourleafprogram.com and that's got all of the details on it. And then it's also available online at fourleafsurvey.com and it goes right to the survey. It takes two minutes. All is 12, it's uh, 12 multiple choice questions. And, um, and you get a score right away as to, it, it, it is intended to, to estimate the percent of your calories that are derived from whole plants. That's, that's the whole, whole idea. Well, mine is 100% and has been for over 43 years, but I'm going to post a link to the survey right now in case anybody else wants to take it. Yep, fourleafsurvey.com. Nice. Come right up. Yep, came right up. So there's a link, guys, if you want to. Well, would you like to share your screen now? I know you've got a wonderful presentation planned sure. for us. I can hit share screen and... Uh... Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and start my slideshow here. Can everybody see that? Perfect. All right, so um, you want me to go ahead and start this presentation, AJ? Yes, look forward to it. Connecting the dots to a sustainable future, conversation with Chef AJ. That's the cover of my latest book, or our latest book, Outcry, uh, Urgent Alarms from Our Planet and What We Can Do About Them. Uh, at the top, it says, is there a COVID-19 silver lining, and yes, we believe there are a number of them, and I'll get to those later, but first I want to acknowledge my co-author, Stuart Scott, who is the founder and executive director of scientistswarning.org, uh, but his claim to fame, as he will admit, and he thinks it might help him get into heaven someday, is he is the one that, that invited and uh, invited and then introduced Greta Thunberg to the world stage in 2018 at the COP24 climate conference. And there he is pictured with her in two different places. So I wanna to get to the, to the book itself. Uh, James Cameron, who's become a friend of mine, describes our global dilemma on the cover. And he, he has authorized that statement that he made in an email to me to, to appear on the cover. And he said, the world is completely delusional and going to hell in a handbasket as fast as humanly possible. The only relevant question is, how do we make the crash as soft a landing as possible for some kind of continuation of human civilization? So, and we do it by taking bold action now. And in so doing, we should be guided by this message of urgency from the straight talking governor of Washington and that's Jay Inslee. We are the first generation to feel the sting of climate change, and we are the last generation that can do something about it. And we want to do it for all of the children of the world. It is imperative that we indeed do something about it. For their sake, we must jolt ourselves into thinking differently, a process that we describe in the final chapter of Outcry. So let's begin connecting the dots to a sustainable future. The dots between the way we have chosen to live on this planet and nature's ability to sustain us. Let's just hope we do a better job than the Rapa Nui of Easter Island, which is pictured here, who were on the verge of extinction when Dutch explorers arrived there in 1722. Their fairly advanced civilization had collapsed long before on this barren island that was once a lush 
paradise. So we start when connecting the dots, we start with five grossly unsustainable situations, all of which must be addressed. No particular order here, overpopulation. Uh, people, people don't even hardly talk about that very much, but in a world where that's one of our single biggest problems, there are, there are many, many countries, governments, and religions who think it's immoral for a woman to practice birth control. It's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, we have an eternal growth economy in a world of finite resources. We're dependent on fossil fuels. Our food choices, I've got in color down there because that's, that's the one that everybody can do quickly and we've already got too much CO2 in the atmosphere already. Mother Nature pictured here is not happy with what's going on and speaks her mind in the next slide. Here's the table of contents for outcry. Um, there is a forward actually by Mother Nature and, and uh, full disclosure, uh, I actually wrote it, she didn't write it, but she did come to me in a dream and told me what to write. So she, she established the, is the theme of this book in the forward, which is addressed to all humans in the de developed world. And that's because the, the humans in the developed world are the ones that have done all the damage and all the suffering is being done by the people in the undeveloped world. A brief excerpt here from the forward from Mother, Mother Nature. As a result of your failed stewardship of this planet, things are likely to become very painful for you in the future. And for that, I'm terribly sorry. But frankly, I've run out of patience with you and your selfish ways. Quite simply, you've become very problematic tenants who are now in serious danger of being evicted. Uh, part one of the book you can see in the table of contents is basically making the case from the scientist and from nature herself about what's going on and why we need to to change the way we're living if we expect to begin living sustainably on the planet. In part two, which is longer, is basically a vision of how we can solve this problem and what we might can do. Uh, so I, I wanted it to be a positive book and not dwell on all of the negatives. There's plenty of negatives in the first part of this book, but I don't think that it's, it's uh, an, an un, un, un solvable problem. It won't be easy as I will explain. So yes, she used the word tenants here and she is our landlord and we don't really own anything. When you think about it, if we all died, what would happen to all the money? We're just one of billions of species of tenants on this planet, but the only one that is not living in harmony with nature. And the, uh, there are lots of animals that we've created for ourselves to eat or to be our servile companions, but they are really all part of humanity because we created them. They did not evolve naturally in the natural world. So regarding those five grossly unsustainable situations, let's begin with the food choices. That's the one that everybody can change overnight if they choose to do so. And this is uh, something that I concluded a few years back. I call it the protein myth. And this is what has severely hampered the, the shift to a, to a whole food plant-based diet. The protein myth and the related locked brain syndrome, as I call it. So, but first I wanna, I wanna give you a little bit of background. I told you earlier, these are my two books that I wrote before Outcry, Healthy Eating, Healthy World. And I kind of told you about my journey up until this point. Here's the protein myth. Because of the mistaken, yet almost ubiquitous belief that we humans actually need to eat animal protein to be healthy, a host of incredibly powerful plant-based solutions to the world's most serious health, hunger, and sustainability crises never even make it to the table for consideration. And I tell you what, my estimate here is that 95% at least of all PhD Doctors, and I'm not talking medical doctors necessarily, but educators and business people, brilliant people, I believe that 95% believe that protein myth. And that is a huge problem. So here's the bottom line on our love affair with eating meat. On a per calorie basis, 
I computed this myself. On average, animal-based foods require over 10 times as much land, water, and energy as do plant-based foods. 10 times. I mean, what don't you get it about 10 times? It's, it's just absolutely, I, I mean, after studying this for 18 years, I still can't believe that people are not putting it together. As such, there are serious consequences re resulting from the locked brain syndrome. For if we cannot take the animal out of the equation when it comes to feeding ourselves, we will never learn to live in harmony with nature, thereby placing the future of our civilization and our species in serious jeopardy. So how are we doing so far? You see the animals there on the right. Uh, meat production by region, of every region of the world. Global tonnage has increased doubled since 1980, and it has increased sevenfold in just my lifetime. So we're not doing a very good job at all. It's like we haven't even started, and we really haven't. For every person in North America that's moving toward a plant-based diet, there's 10 times that many at least moving in the opposite direction in the developed world. So here's the, the, the origin of the four leaf. And I, I don't have this in my standard presentation, but I put it in here for Chef AJ and her large audience of plant-based enthusiasts uh, as, as I am. The four leaf idea or concept, nurturing all 100 trillion of our cells is based on Colin Campbell's definition of the optimal diet. Very simple. The closer we get to eating a diet of whole plant-based foods, the better off we will be. And so that's why the survey was designed to, to figure out, uh, help people estimate how many, how many calories are they actually getting from whole plant-based foods. So one leaf is over 20%, two leaf over 40, three leaf over, over 60, and four leaf over 80. And it's impossible to to estimate accurately or even compute accurately because of so many different kinds of food all mixed together. But this survey does a pretty good job. And I can tell you, uh, if people are honest about it, 90, over 90% 90 of the US population would score below the one leaf level. And that is, that there are two levels below one leaf. One is called the standard American diet. That's the lowest level. And the one be between the standard American diet and one leaf is called better than most. And I added that category after using the survey for about a year because people were scoring at the bottom level all the time of, of the standard American diet. And I wanted to, wanted to make it a little bit positive. So it's not necessarily vegetarian or vegan. I mean, you could have one, one little sip of cream in your coffee once a month and you wouldn't be a vegan. It's focusing on what we do eat, not what we're avoiding. Implied wiggle room. People love to imply a little wiggle room. I may have had a, something last night. It had, had some egg in it and a, a, an hors d'oeuvre that I had at a party. I'm not going to worry about that because I'm a four-leaf eater and, and that's fine. So here's my, uh, as, a sing, as a single man for much of my life, uh, at least 18 years of it, um, I call this my easy meals at home, the four, four, four meals, four leaf, four minutes, four bucks. And I've become a real diligent shopper at Trader Joe's, but I can tell you, I think you can see my corner here, the, the organic brown rice and the edamame and a little bit of this Japanese style fried rice comprise probably 60% of the calories in my meals. And then I load it up with, uh, all kind of fresh vegetables. And then I use things like this. This is rice cauliflower bowl from Trader Joe's. And I just use maybe one tenth of that carton for seasoning. It's really a, a spicy, spicy kind of meal, although it's got some tofu in it, but it's all, all plant-based. And then of course my Bragg seasoning. But uh, yeah, that's, that's I, I can have a meal in four minutes and I love it every time I eat it. I don't ever get tired of it. So, but of course, it's not just the food. It's also about the way we live. Modern society will find no solution to the ecological problem unless it takes a serious look at its lifestyle. Pope John Paul II. So when it comes to modifying our lifestyles enough to prevent our disease as a species, can these guys save us? Everybody's familiar with these 
NGO organizations that work on, on the environment. The problem is, you know, I would like to think so, but I know enough about them. I know they don't take food choices seriously and they have no vision for a sustainable civilization in the future. They also fo focus more on the kind of energy we use rather than on the unsustainable lifestyles and economy that are rapidly killing the biosphere that keeps us alive. I happened to be sitting in a meeting in 2013 and the CEO of one of these organizations was there and the number two man from another one of these organizations was there in a meeting of 22 people. Host of the meeting asked them, you know, I've looked at you, you guys' websites and I don't see a whole lot about, about the food problem in terms of climate change. And he said, why don't you have any information? That's a really big deal. And these guys knew the host and, and they knew that he was right. And both of them admitted, both of them admitted that if we became known as anti-meat, it would destroy our fundraising. Well, to me, that, that is almost criminal. When you think about the fact that if we don't quit eating animal-based foods, we're not ever gonna uh, be able to sustain ourselves long-term. So. I won't dwell on those guys. I, I think some of them, are, are, they mean well, a lot of employees there mean well, but they're not looking at the big picture and they're not working on the big picture. So this, this uh, slide is, is in, included in the book in two places. How green is green enough? No one knows how green we must live to survive. So I suggest that we challenge ourselves to err on the side of living even greener than nature demands. Why is that? because we are likely to get only one chance to get this right. To be clear, we're talking about the urgent need to totally reinvent every aspect of the way we live as we create a human habitat where only green lifestyle choices exist. And this is the kind of the areas of our lives that, that have to be changed out for more efficient methods uh, if we are to survive or give ourselves the best possible chance of survival. First part of the book, con connecting the dots regarding urgent alarms from nature, the droughts, the floods, the fires, and boy, you in California, AJ, have de are definitely familiar with the fires this year. As is frequently reported, 19 of the hottest 20 years have occurred since 2000. Polar ice and glaciers are melting, coral reefs and rainforests are disappearing, and don't forget the fires. The bigger the circle, the bigger the fire on this 100 year graph of California. And look at the, the stat on the bottom. In, in this month, earlier this month, six of the largest 20 fires in California history were all burning at the same time. Birds, insects, and coral, all are in terminal decline and we depend on all of them for our survival. Insects from a 2019 study in Australia, they said half of insects in the world would be gone in 50 years and all will be gone in 100 years unless there are some serious changes in our lifestyles. Chapter four features nine big picture scientists. Uh, some of their conclusions about our demise are very troubling. Their consensus is very troubling. Uh, there's only one of them and that's T. Colin Campbell, that I believe really gets it about food choices. I think they, they are all affected by the protein myth, but they know their science and that's why they're in the book. They're talking about what it's gonna take for us to survive and live sustainably uh, with nature. We take their concerns seriously, but are more optimistic about our chances than many of them are and we'll explain why we are more optimistic after hearing from five of them. So let's begin with the most famous. Everybody knows who Jacques Cousteau is, described by Ted Turner as the father of the modern environmental movement. He told Ted in 1993, four years before his death at 87, the following. We've passed the threshold. The beginning of the end has started. Man may or may not be part of the plan nature has for the earth in the future. Life will be reborn, but first, the world as we know it now will die, will die. Ted Turner was very disturbed about that and could not believe 
what he was hearing, uh, but he, he stuck by his conclusion. Continuing with the one who may be the best informed re regarding species extinction, this is Frank Min Finner. He was the, the lead doctor, the lead guy on the study for smallpox eradication around the world, esteemed Australian physician. Um, and he led the team that, that eradicated smallpox. He concluded at the age of 95 in 2010, shortly before his death. Homo sapiens will become extinct, perhaps within a hundred years. A lot of other animals will too. It's an irreversible situation. I think it's too late. And then here's uh, Stephen Emmott, who I met in London in 2013. He directed computational science at Microsoft, a uh, brilliant guy, possibly the most informed big picture scientist on the planet. He's about 60 now. This is what he wrote in the final two, three sentences of his book, 10 Billion, that was published in 2013. I saw him about a month after the book was published and I had, uh, had tea with him in London. He says, as a scientist, what do I think about our current situation? Science is essentially organized skepticism. I spend my life trying to prove my work wrong or look for alternative explanations for my results. I hope I'm wrong. But the science points to my not being wrong. We are urgently need to do, and I mean actually do, something radical to avert a global catastrophe. But I don't think we will. I think we are effed. And he used the F word with no apology. And here's, I have to say, one of my favorites of all time, James Lovelock. Uh, he's alive and well at 101, published a book at, at age 99, uh, viewing the earth as one giant self, self uh, re reinforcing system that he dubbed Gaia. This living legend grasps the relevant global big picture more consistent completely than perhaps any other scientist in history. He expressed this dire conclusion in a 2010 BBC film. When you see the whole picture, it is really fearsomely bad. I fear that not many of us will survive at best about a billion, possibly a lot less than that. And this next statement is very succinctly defining what sustainable living is all about. If the earth improves as a result of our presence, then we will flourish. If it doesn't, we will die off. So, this is a picture of what our presence looks like. And here's a question for you. Is the earth improving because of our presence? And this is Peter Wadhams. I've also gotten to know him. I saw him uh, speak and uh, he follows all of my stuff that I, that I post on the internet about once a week. He is arguably the world's leading authority on the connection between the Arctic Ocean and climate change. He concludes this. Our only chance is to urgently begin removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And by the way, he, he was not a whole food plant-based eater, but he is coming around. He says he's now eating better since he met me. So that's, uh, that causes me to have even more respect for him. He says the melting Arctic sea ice is the canary in the coal mine. And you know what that means. When the canary dies, the humans aren't far behind. Temperatures are rising much faster in the Arctic than in the rest of the world, as he points out. As a result, the ice is rapidly disappearing. Tragically, most humans, I would say 95%, the same as the ones that believe the protein myth, most humans think that's a good thing. Why is that? Why do they think such, such a thing? Three things, faster shipping lanes across the top of the earth, more tourism opportunities and more oil, of course. So this is something I check every day. This is the Arctic sea ice extent. I check it every day, 365 days a year. Uh, the lines that you see are the sea ice maximum every year in early March and the minimum in mid-September every year. And in summer minimum in 1980 was just under 8 million square kilometers. That's that line. This is where it is now. 
Compare that to September of 2020. 3.8 million less square kilometers of Arctic ice are up there right now than there were at this date in 1980. And that, that area, 3.8 million acres, is an area nine times larger than California. That, that big of a, uh, of a piece of land, of water, has turned from white to blue. And what happens when you turn the ocean from white to blue? It's a case of albedo, which is the reflection of heat from the ice up into space. That's 85% albedo for ice. 7% for, for water. So what that means is we're getting now 93% is now being absorbed. 93% of the heat from the sun is being absorbed by the blue. And, and that's causing those temperatures to rise rapidly. It's changing weather patterns all over the world. It's irreversible. This is gonna happen. It's just a question, can we learn to live within the climate that, is gonna, that we're gonna be susceptible to? So why are we more optimistic about our long-term chances of survival than these big picture scientists seem to be? Four potential game changers, in my mind, in which most may be lacking in knowledge, expertise, or experience. As I mentioned, I think T. Colin Campbell is the only one of the nine who totally gets it about food. But here are, here are the four choices for, uh, for uh, for areas of expertise. Food choices, I'm pretty sure most of them don't get it about food. Systemic change when it comes to changing the way we live. We can't just ask people to recycle their garbage and use solar panels. We have to change our whole system of living. Artificial intelligence, I doubt these, these people, uh, Dr. Emmott probably knows a lot about it, but in terms of leadership overall, who's gonna lead a project to change the way we live? These are scientists. These aren't people that go out and manage huge projects. So knowing what I know about those four categories, it gives me optimism that if we get the right people involved, we can solve this problem. While we respect them greatly, we are more confident than they are that we can learn to live in harmony with nature by leveraging these four disciplines to completely replace our civilization with one that can actually improve the biosphere. What about infrastructure renewal? Well, this was, these are photos from Superstorm Sandy in 2012. I was living in this area at the time. Uh, does it really make sense to spend trillions of dollars repairing or replacing existing infrastructure that will likely be underwater in 50 years? There are situations like this all over the country that it doesn't make sense to, to rebuild something that's unsustainable. So willy-nilly infrastructure replacement is not going to save us. We must have a realistic vision. This is my conclusion. We must have a realistic vision and plan for a whole new way of sustainable living in order for us to survive or to give us the greatest chances to survive and thrive on the planet. Let's talk about that vision in the next few slides. It all starts with vision and leadership. Jack Welch, GE CEO, Good business leaders create a vision. They articulate the vision, passionately own the vision and relentlessly drive it to completion. And we love what Buckminster Fuller had to say about changing things in terms of changing the way we live. Quote, you can never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's exactly what we've tried to do. And I'll cover that in the next few slides. We also definitely need a new system of living on this planet. And whatever we decide, we're going to need a brand new sustainability focused method of scorekeeping or economy for, if you will. We call it earthonomics, a term that Stuart and I came up with. Here's our definition of earthonomics, which would replace capitalism. Did you ever stop to think about just how ridiculous capitalism truly is? An international scorekeeping system that guarantees the never ending depletion of the Earth's finite resources until they are all gone. Obviously, we need a better way to keep score. So here's Earthonomics. Now, I can't tell you how it's going to work, but I can tell you how the score ought to be kept. A way of keeping score on planet Earth 
that rewards all actions to improve the biosphere and punishes those that inflict damage. And I'm saying punishes those individuals and those nations that choose to inflict damage. So let's imagineer a world where that is possible. We call it the Great Big Northern. Here it is, the Great Big Northern or GBN, a magical place, a magical living corridor where only green options exist. So you can't live an unsustainable life because those options aren't there. So here's the futuristic vision, 3000 mile living corridor near the Canadian border, 25 miles wide with a fabulous hyperloop system in the center, housing up to 300 million people with 70% less population density than New York City has now. World's largest farmer's markets, full employment, no homelessness, and the same superior health care for all. I know you think I've lost my mind, but bear with me. The greenest part of the GBN, now this is all using today's technology, magnificent hyperloop system using today's technology, replacing over 90% of domestic air and automo automobile travel shown below. In that living corridor, all citizens will be less than a half day of luxurious travel from everyone they know without a car, an airplane, a bus, or a truck. So what about governance and jobs? And I mentioned all those things we'd have in that living corridor, pecking order in the GBN. Consider this analogy. Consider, think about a huge aircraft carrier in the US Navy with a crew of 5,000. This analogy illustrates the concept of governance and mission alignment, not physical conditions. So don't, don't think about living on the aircraft carrier, just the system of, of managing it. Think about this, every crew member, like every resident, of the GBN want, will want to be there. They won't get to go to the GBN initially. It'll be by invitation only and everyone will have to sign an agreement about the way they would live. Every crew member obviously has to sign an agreement and be sworn into the US Navy and agree to abide by the rules. But they wanna be there. They trained to be there. They were educated to be there. They all have exciting jobs, uniforms, meals, salary, entertainment, social life, and a comfortable place to sleep. There's no homelessness on the aircraft carrier. There's a defined pecking order from the captain on down to the lowest seaman based on each person's level of contribution. The entire crew is 100% aligned with the same mission. This is very important. Their vessel is crucially important as is ours pictured here. This is our vessel. This is our living vessel. The only planet in the universe capable of keeping us alive that illustrates our biosphere. Nothing is more important than this essential vessel that keeps us alive. To be clear, we envision that GBN will be infinitely freer and far more participatory, much more luxurious than any military vessel. So how green are we living now in the developed world? Well, as an engineer by training and by work most of my life, my estimate, between 10 and 20% as efficient as we need to be. Clearly, we've got a lot of work to do and there's not much margin for error. So what if we fail? Consider the disaster for all of the children if we err on the side of taking out too few of our unsustainable habits. So as we plan our new system of living, we must keep this guideline in mind. When in doubt, take it out. I'm talking about unsustainable living habits. Without a doubt, many of the things you love now will not be possible in a sustainable environment, but there will be trade-offs of things that you never even imagined possible that will replace them. So there will be an adjustment period giving up things that we love, activities that we love, but there will be things that will be beyond our wildest dreams that will be replacing those kinds of things. What about other countries? How do they fit in? Well, they can build on our model. They can modify it, try it out. They can use us as consultants to help them. The global conversation, what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do with the book is just start the conversation because nobody is really talking about it. I, I, I am so amazed that there's just no conversation about 
a rapid change in the, in the way our whole civilization works. So this is chapter 12 in, in the book, when all else fails, can AI save us, artificial intelligence? In a world with 195 countries and thousands of religions, it seems highly unlikely to this practical engineer that we will ever get this mammoth GBN, Great Big Northern, kind of task accomplished without a great deal of help from our lightning fast thinking robotic friends. My friend and idol here, Dr. Lovelock agrees, concluding in this 2019 book, Novacine, that he wrote about artificial intelligence. He says, the coming age of hyperintelligence. He says, we need not be afraid. We shall not descend into the kind of war between humans and machines that is so often described in science fiction because we need each other. Gaia will keep the peace. Gaia is his theory of, of every, everything, uh, this, the earth being a self-regulating overall system. So I have two quotes here, one from two people who know quite a bit about AI, Elon Musk and Vladimir Putin. Elon Musk says, I'm very close to the cutting edge in AI and it scares the hell out of me. Its capabilities vastly are vastly more than almost anyone knows and the rate of improvement is exponential. Vladimir Putin with some chilling remarks. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. That band doesn't make jokes. And I would believe that he's thinking about that. So wrapping up here, I mentioned COVID-19 silver lining at the beginning. I think, I think we're all seeing the silver, silver lining right now. In fact, what AJ and I are doing right now with this conference would not have happened if, there, if it wasn't a COVID-19. Uh, everybody's life has changed. Every, every student's life has dramatically changed everybody's work habits, their living habits, everything in our lives have changed. Nobody would have ever believed that could happen, but it did. And that tells me that something like the GBN can happen because it's gonna be nice and there's gonna be better. And by the way, all these pandemics have origins with us messing around with animals in the animal world. We've gotta give all this land back to nature, fix us a nice comfortable place in, in a fraction of the acreage and learn to live and respect our, our hostess, Mother Earth. So how do we save our biosphere? We listen to the troubling conclusions of those scientists as we envision and plan our future way of life, one that may or may not look anything like the GBN. I'm, I'm not claiming to have all the answers here. That was just a visual to help spark a global conversation uh, got two R's in there for some reason on conversation about radical lifestyle changes that are appealing and necessary. Sound crazy to you? Good, because people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do, Steve Jobs. So are we crazy enough? If not, let's, let's get crazy now. Read the book, encourage others to read it. Have me conduct free Zoom conferences with your group. Join with friends to help spark the much needed conversation calling for massive systemic change. The more people are talking about this crucial topic, the greater the chance that powerful leaders will take notice and something will start to happen. These are my primary websites that you can find. I'll leave that on for a second while AJ and I wrap up. Um, but you can see the fourleafsurvey.com, the fourleaf program. I uh, also have a system for helping large employers with, with hundreds of thousands of employees save money on healthcare, an automated system called archbyfourleaf.com. You can look at that. And I'm normally coming to you from the Green Mountain State of Vermont, but I'm in, in New Jersey today. So, that is uh, the conclusion. I'll leave that there and, and I can stop sharing now. Should I do that now? Sure, AJ? yeah. And you guys have any questions for Jim? That was a wonderful presentation and just your sound of your voice just made it even more pleasurable. So thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing and the passion. It just seems like not everybody is as concerned as you. I mean, in the world, not the people watching, of course. 
Well, it, it just it just amazes me, AJ, to uh, every time I'm, I'm in large groups, I was in a large group last night, I was afraid it was a super spreader event, and I was trying to stay off the dance floor and everything else, but, and I'm just looking at, and, and I just can't, can't believe the, the number of people and a lot of them highly educated medical doctors in the room and nobody's even talking about it. It's like they're just putting, putting it, and, and most people are, are not aware. I mean, it's not in the news. You have to search the New York Times, which I get on a daily basis. And, but I, I look at news from all over and the stories about sustainability human sustainability on this planet are nowhere, nowhere in there. There's, a, there's quite a bit on climate change, but it's, it's never the lead story in the New York Times. There's never anything, anything similar to that. So uh, I, I think there needs to be a, a, a really urgent conversation led by people in, in positions of power. I have, a, uh, I have a conversation dream team, which includes the 10 most famous billionaires in the United States. And I chose them because, not because of their wealth, uh, the size of their wealth, of their fortune, but because they are the best known and include people uh, like my friend, Jim, Cam Jim Cameron, and also uh, Ralph Lauren, who I worked for, for, for a number of years in his company. But I have people like Bill Gates and Elon Musk and, and, and others that, uh, you know, Zuckerberg and Bloomberg and, and Oprah, I have Oprah on there. And what I figured is if we could get that group of 10 people, the thing about super wealthy people, they have staff that will return the calls of all the other super wealthy people. So let's say Bill Gates decided he wanted to get a meeting together and discuss what I've been talking about today. It'd be his meeting, but he invite those 10 people. And they come up with sort of a, a plan of what they want to do to start a conversation. With the internet subscription around the world, every person in the world with, a, with the internet would know about that meeting in 24 hours. So, I mean, we're just one super wealthy, super uh, caring in leader away from, from something magnificent beginning to happen. But as an engineer, you know, when I first started studying in 2002 about food, I had no idea it was going to take me to where I am now, concerned about our very existence as a species. And I've got eight grandchildren now. I've got three in college. And, you know, I, I want to be remembered. They call me Grand Buddy. That was a name that I, I gave myself. The boys call me GB for short. But I want them to remember me as Grand Buddy did everything he possibly could. But most of them won't, won't eat this way, won't eat the right way. And uh, they are in college and most young people in college already think they know most of what there is to know. So <laughs> I, I, I do the best I can. Well, thank you. Do, do you remember Dave Middlesworth? Dave Middlesworth, I, I don't believe I've ever met him. No, he, he, Linda said, you're, well, maybe, maybe you didn't know him, but he, uh, Linda, who's watching, said that his, her, her late husband, Dave, admired you very, very much. They're vegans from Sacramento. Oh. You know, it's interesting, Jim, like, you know, so we, where I live, masks are mandatory. I'm not getting into whether, uh, you know, we should wear them or not, but that's the law and I choose to obey the law. So I'll go to the grocery store once a week and I'll see everybody wearing their mask, think whether they're doing it just because they're obeying the law or because they think it's going to protect them. And then you look in the cart and I'm thinking, you're not protected from the mask anyway, because right. what's in your cart, you know, which is, and, and it seems like nobody even talks about the fact that the, because this pandemic was because of eating animals. You're like, that should be on the cover of the New York Times, you know? Yeah. And they yeah. don't, they don't hardly, hardly mention it. Who, who's the guy that plant-based news, the, the, the Englishman that, uh, he, he posted a really nice video about that very fact right after the pandemic started about the, why, why are we not hearing about the fact that this all came from, from us violating nature and, and interfering with nature and, in terms of eating wild animals and, and eating animals that, that interfere with other wild animals. So it's just uh, people are unaware and, and don't really want to know. Exactly. And it's like, you know, they, they're not, they're, they're certainly not trying to leave the planet in a better 
place than when they found it. <laughs> yeah, and I was I was actually amazed at what I found with these what I call the big picture scientists and all of the findings. Uh, I never knew that about Jacques Cousteau. Uh, Colin Campbell is is uh, you know I know very well, but in his book uh, Hole H W H O L E, everyone's probably familiar with that book. He said. Uh, regarding plant-based eating, he said, nothing less than our future as a species hangs in the balance. That, that quote was in the forward, uh, the first chapter of that book. So he gets it. And um, it was Colin Campbell that introduced me to Dr. Robert Goodland, who was the, the, the guy at the World Bank. He was the first ecologist to ever work at the World Bank. Dr. John McDougall did a great video of him you can find online. Um, right before he died, I was getting to know Dr. Goodland via an email introduction from Dr. Campbell, and that was in September of 2013. Um, and two, three months later, he died on a trekking fall in, in the uh, Himalayas. And so I never got to meet him in, in person, but he's the one, he and Jeff Enhang, who I've gotten to know pretty well since uh, Dr. Goodland's death, uh, I went to Dr. Goodland's memorial service in Washington, D.C., met his, his wife, his, spouse, his uh, widow, and I met Jeff Enhang, and the head of the UN Environment Group was there to speak. I mean, it was, he was a big deal. And his study, their study, basically concluded that at least 51% of all greenhouse gases caused by humans are from livestock. 51, that means more than everything else put together, but it hadn't got a lot of traction. Yeah, you know, it, it's just not as many people are as passionate about this as you. I mean, Dr. McDougall is one of them, and it just, like you say, it's it's doesn't doesn't get the the, the airtime it deserves. People don't want to hear about it, and a large part of the problem is that protein myth too. When you start talking about changing their diet. Uh, People would be happy to drive an electric car and put solar panels on the roof and recycle and do things like that, but that's not going to save us. Yeah. We're adding yeah. seven or eight million people every month in the population. Uh, well, I've added zero, just so you know. <laughs> you know, it was interesting, Jim, when the pandemic first started and the sheltering was really seriously happening. It was like it was it was like the the planet got cleaned up for a little bit. You could you know the pollution went away. The, you could hear birds. It was incredible. The the you could see things changing. Yes, exactly. It it uh, there's there's been a there's been lots of silver linings with this whole thing, but. The biggest silver lining to reiterate is, is the fact that we now know that we can dramatically change the way we live and still be happy. I think happier. I think if we were all on the same page and got rid of all kind of homelessness and, and hunger and, and all of the issues that so many of the humans suffer on this planet, uh, the super wealthy will not like the great big northern idea, would, want to, would not want to live there, but some of them might depending on how much they contributed to nature, they would, they would be wealthy there in terms of benefits and, and rights and privileges because the people who do, do the most for nature will, will, will be running the show. I love how in one of your presentations, you talked about the earth, we call it mother earth and, and the way we're treating our mother and that we're killing our mother. And it's interesting because a plant-based diet will solve everything from global warming to animal suffering to human health. And yet when you think about it statistically, very, very few people really eat this way. Uh, you know, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, I, I run across very, very few and uh, they, they try to complicate it, you know, and they say, well, it's too expensive. You know, my 444 plan, $4.44 a meal, the, the Trader Joe's on a price per calorie, 22 cents per 100 calories of that frozen brown rice that's already cooked. All you do is heat it up and it takes tastes like freshly made whole grain brown rice, 22 cents per 100 calories. I mean, you're not talking, talking about too many servings to, to make a meal. Throw some seasonings on there and some beans and some veggies and, you know, I'm pretty easy to please when it comes to eating my whole plants. So Blair, who's watching live has a question. What's the best way to present this information to, to friends and family so that they'll be able to understand it and digest it? 
Well, it's clear. Yeah. you know, obviously, I would say uh, that first he he should first read the book and decide if it's something that his, his family could handle. Uh, I think it's a book that the average eleventh grader could understand and read it in probably less than a day. And I tried to make it more about positive things than negative things, without being uh, dishonest. I had to be honest about the situation we're in, but then describing in great detail. I did. I, I presented maybe one percent of the the details that I thought about for that great big northern. But uh, you know. It doesn't really matter what those details are. It's just that we have to replace everything we're doing now with something much more efficient. And if we do it right, we can make it more luxurious, more fulfilling, more exciting than what we have today. Without all the stresses of worrying about income and where are you going to get a place to stay and the billions of homeless people in the world. We, we have really kind of made a mess and a lot of us are privileged in the United States and Europe and other developed nations. But uh, if we do it right, we can, we, we can easily, Jeff Bezos has enough money to feed the world. If you just give him those, those beans from Trader Joe's, everybody would be able to eat. But it's all, the, the wealth's all concentrated in a few and there aren't, aren't any, no one seems to be really thinking about creating a way to live that prosper, that's prosperous for every human being. Yeah, and that's very sad. I, like I said to Ingrid Newkirk the other day that I'm ashamed of my species. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, would, I would have to agree. <laughs> and what? Just to, to see the people in the developing world that, you know, we go in and tear out the Amazon forest and displace the indigenous people and we, we tear up the forest so, so we can grow soybeans to ship to feed the pigs in China. You know, it, it's just, we are just absolutely have lost our minds. We don't care about anything except ourselves, our possessions, our friends, our family, and that's it. Well, a few of us do care. And that's really why I'm doing this show to get all the people to care to, to, to give the message how to get the other ones to care. I don't know. Cause even people that are, you know, it's, it's interesting how people say, Oh, I love animals. And I, I learned, you know, vegan since I'm 17, if you love them, you don't eat them. That's just kind of what love is. But you know, you, you say like, would you read this book or would you watch this movie? Oh, I don't want to know. I don't want to know because if they know then they might have to do something. That's right. That's right. Sometimes I wish I'd never learned all this stuff. <laughs> Well, once the lights turned on, it's kind of hard to go back in the dark, isn't it, Jim? You can't go back. You can't unknow it. That's and, right. Um, I think my mother would have been on my side. My mother, my mother was very religious, and there's a lot of religious dogma that that I don't believe anymore that that she believed. However, I think that she she appreciated intelligence, and she t always told me, Jim, God gave you a brain and he expects you to use it. And, and if I, she were alive today, I could tell her, mother, I know I'm not doing all the things you trained me to do as, as in terms of our religion, but I believe that I'm trying to do what you told me to do is uh, use my brain. And, and we could say, or you could say that maybe God is working through me, who knows, if that's what you choose to believe. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation, a wonderful presentation. And now everybody knows why Dr. Colin Campbell admires you so much. <laughs> well, thank you, AJ, for having me. Absolutely. And you know what? If uh, if this, this doesn't work out, you have a tremendous career as a voiceover actor, because seriously, you have an incredible voice. Well, I, I really appreciate that now. Yeah, it's just really easy to listen to. Well, thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate this so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. We're going to continue this conversation about the environment if you come back at 2 p.m. today when I will be interviewing probably one of the world's youngest activists, certainly one of the youngest people to ever give a TED Talk. I'm going to be talking to Genesis Butler. Thanks again, Jim. Be well. Thank you, AJ.